at zero. Position, Chaiken Sector, ETA 1 Standard Hour 40. Can assist with medical and oxygen. Please note deploying in requisition Neomoidian vessel. No defensive capacity. Repeat, negative armament. Strongly advise any GAR vessel to ping transponder before opening fire. Be aware that separatist traffic in sector has increased in last 20 minutes in response to fleet movements. <laughs> Prepare for unwanted company. Signal received at Fleet Ops. Passed to military intelligence in 1-1. Captain Ordo and acknowledged. Vessels responding now. Fearless. Majestic. An impounded enemy shuttle. Advised to assume extraction may be opposed. Chapter 4 367 days after Geonosis. It was cold and pitch black in the cockpit, but it certainly beat being dead. Fee kept his suit temperature at the bare minimum to conserve power. He flicked on his spot lamp briefly and checked the trust and shivered suspects who were lying against the deck. A human, and disturbingly, to Nikto. Fee had only seen Nikto in obscure databases devoted to identifying the best part of their anatomy to aim at to stop them dead. They were tough. Intel said they could defeat Jedi. They were even rumored to have a weapon that could deflect and destroy a lightsaber blade. Maybe Jedi needed to tool up with pep lasers then. And all the prisoners had tested positive for explosives residue when Darman had run his sensor over them. With the intel and the heavily encrypted data on their pads, the three looked like being dead to rights, as Skirata would say. But it was a long way from being satisfied that they'd snatched the right people to actually extracting useful information from them. Fee took his thermal plastifoil survival blanket from his backpack and folded it carefully over the human, who seemed to be more affected by cold than the Nikto. Losing a suspect to hypothermia after going to all this trouble to grab them wasn't an option. Wrapping a body wasn't an easy maneuver in Zero-G, but at least he'd stopped feeling sick. The ultralight plastifoil kept drilling away every time the man shuddered. Fee sighed and took out his universal solution to any problem, a roll of thick adhesive tape and hooked his leg around a handrail to stop himself floating while he tore off lengths. He taped the blanket to the suspect, then he secured the trust suspect to the deck with more of the tape. It was amazing how handy tape could be. And don't ask me to tuck you in and read you a story. The human just stared balefully at him. He had a lovely black eye now from resisting Darman a little too vigorously. They never have happy endings. The man's ID said Far or Jewel, but nobody took that too seriously. He was about 30, fine blonde hair, sharp features, very pale blue eyes. The Nikto claimed to be Imtruli and Gisk, or at least their mining licenses did, because none of the suspects was talking. SOPs, or Standard Operating Procedures, said they had to stop prisoners from talking to each other before processing but SOPs hadn't allowed for the little complication of running out of air before an interrogator could be found. Niner turned his head slightly to Orjul. You can talk to us, or you can wait until Sergeant Vow sits down with a nice cup of calf and asks you to tell him your life story. He's a good listener, and you'll really want to talk to him. There was no response. Apart from the brief curses and grunts of pain they'd admitted when Omega stormed the cockpit and subdued them, Fee loved military understatement, none of the suspects had said a single word, not even name, rank, or serial number. And of course, the two who were dry-frozen somewhere in the vacuum of space weren't going to provide many answers of their own free will either. Look, shall I try to get some information out of these gentlemen? Just in case the taxi doesn't get here before our air runs out, Fee asked. We're not trained to interrogate prisoners, said Niner. Fee maneuvered himself above the human. He didn't know what Nikto felt or feared, and suspected that it wasn't much. 
but he knew plenty about his own species' vulnerabilities. Eh, I could improvise. No, you'll bounce off the bulkheads, expend too much oxygen, and then we'll have to slot them to preserve the supply for us. It can wait. Vow isn't going anywhere, and neither are they. Niner was reclining in the pilot's chair, restraining belt buckled and staring straight ahead. The blue T of his visor was reflected in the transparasteel viewscreen, making him look wonderfully droid-like. Fee wasn't sure if Niner was simply saying coldly brutal things to intimidate the prisoners or not. Fee was not entirely sure whether he was really joking some of the time. War was nothing personal, but somehow Fee felt differently about people who didn't carry a rifle and who didn't kill in honest combat. They were an invisible enemy. Fearfic, even droids stood up where you could see them. He put it out of his mind with a conscious effort, and not only because Ordo had insisted on undamaged prisoners. He knew how to kill, and he knew how to resist pain, but he wasn't sure how to inflict it deliberately. But he was pretty sure that Vow did. He'd leave the job to him. Dorman had positioned himself against the bulkhead with his legs stretched out. He looked asleep, arms folded, head lowered, and his point of view icon in Fee's HUD showed only an image of his belt and lap. Dar could sleep anywhere, anytime. At one point he flinched, as if someone had said something to him, but there was nothing audible on the comlink. Atin, belted into the co-pilot's seat, worked on the assortment of data pads, data sticks, and sheets of flimsy that he'd taken from the suspects, dead and alive, and prodded probes into data ports, doing what he seemed to enjoy best, slicing, hacking, and generally dismantling things. Niner occasionally reached out to grab any of his prizes that floated free. Fee propelled himself forward with a gentle push against the deck and offered his roll of tape. Aten managed a smile and trapped the wayward components on the sticky side, securing the other end on Niner's left forearm plate. Fee, you know I don't mean it, don't you? Niner said suddenly. When I get on your back about stuff, I'm just venting steam. It took Fee aback. Sarge, I think the first thing you ever did was tear me off a strip. And we're still brothers, aren't we? You're just like Sergeant Cal. He never meant any of it either. Did you see the state of him on the Hololink? He looked pretty exhausted. Poor boy. He never stops worrying. Fee paused. It was the first time he'd ever heard Niner use the word Bawir openly. Father. Fee preferred to see everyone burying their fears and wisecracks. This was all too raw. We could be dead in two hours. Well, we've been there a few times before. Fee thought to himself. He shrugged, desperately seeking the other part of him that always had the smart answer ready. I don't know about you, Vod, but I'm planning on getting back to base because Obram still owes me a drink. And your free war and nuts. So Darman wasn't asleep then. Fearfic, I keep getting this weird feeling like someone's here next to me. It's me, Da, but don't ask me to hold your hand. Die cut. He unfolded his arm slowly and turned to Aten. Attica. If you can't decrypt the data, why not just try to send the whole memory back down the hololink as is? That's what I'm doing, Aten said without looking up. The only light in the compartment now was the blue glow from their helmets. Fee noted that Aten had his night vision filter in place to see the small ports on the data pads. You're right, I can't crack the encryption here, but I can dump the data down the link now and let Ordo play with it if I can override the anti-tempering. Otherwise, it'll just delete everything on here. Ten minutes, maybe. I'm not letting this beat me. Niner eased himself out of the seat and gave a tin a pat on the shoulder as he floated past him. I'm going to keep the hololink open. Time to update fleet on our rate of drift anyway. 
They had nothing to say at the moment, and the link was a power drain that they might regret later if things didn't pan out quite as they were hoping. But Phee understood. Cal Scarrata would be going crazy not being able to keep an eye on them at a time like this. It was what he always, always said when things got tough. I'm here, son. He felt he had to be there for them, and he always had been. But weir wasn't exactly the right word. Fee had no idea how he had managed to keep faith with more than a hundred commandos. The link flared into blue light again. Ordo appeared in full armor and looking away from the cam. He must have been at Fleet HQ then to be working with his helmet on like that, and the hollow unit must have been placed on his desk. Omega here, Niner said. Captain, mind if we keep the link open until further notice? Ordo looked around, and Skirata's voice cut in from outside the video's pickup field. I'd kick your ships if you didn't, Adika. You okay? Bored, Sarge. Well, you won't be bored much longer. Majestic and Fearless are on their way. ETA under two hours. Good old mum, Niner said. But you'll probably have help sooner, uh, because Delta Squad are in transit. Oh, we'll never hear the last of this. You haven't met them, son. We've heard enough. Rough, rude boys, Fee said, and rather full of themselves. Yes, but they have oxygen, a functioning drive, and they're just gagging to get to you first, so play nicely with them. Skirata moved into the Hollow Link's visual range and sat down on Ordo's desk, swinging one leg, his injured one. He looked the way he always looked on training exercises, grim, focused, and constantly chewing something. Oh, and don't open fire. They're driving a SEP ship. How did they get a hold of that? Not that the cannon on this crate is working now anyway. Well, I don't think the SEP pilot was keen to part with it. But maybe they promised I'd bring it back when they were finished. Fee cut in again. Anyone looking for Sicko, Sarge? Our TIF pilot? Yes, we'll keep you posted. Skirata glanced at Ordo as if he'd said something. Atin, son, you know Vo's back, don't you? Atin paused for a second, and then carried on tapping a probe on the entrails of a dismantled data pad. He nodded to himself. Yes, Sarge, I noted that. You're coming back to Brigade HQ when we get you out of there, but you steer clear of him, okay? You hear me? Fee was riveted. Atin had never said a word about Val, other than he was hard, but his reactions were telling. He didn't even look toward the hollow image. I promise, Sarge. Don't worry. I'll be around to make sure, too. Atin inhaled audibly, a sign that usually meant he was either exasperated or burying his anger. Fee thought better of asking which. Niner detached the hollow emitter and pickup from his forearm plate, unlatched the small disc from inside the wrist section, and stuck it on the flat shelf that ran along the freighter's console with a rolled up piece of tape. The hollow image of Ordo and Skirata was silent, as was Omega. There was nothing more to discuss, just having that visual link was enough to comfort everyone. It was a long, silent half hour. Maybe Darman slept, and maybe he didn't, but Fee suspected he was just thinking. Atin's ten-minute estimate had stretched somewhat, but he plowed on, head down, completely focused. Atin was exactly what he was. Not stubborn, as basic translated the word, a negative refusal to change, but Atin in the Mandoa sense. Courageously persistent, tenacious, the hallmark of a man who would never give up or give in. Eventually, he let out a breath. Ah, <sighs> sorted. He leaned forward to connect the data port to the hollow link. Downloading now. Plus, Dar's explosives profiling and some images of the prisoners. 
Sorry we didn't get pictures of the dead ones, but they wouldn't look too cute now anyway. All yours, Captain. That's my boy, Skirata said. Well, he was now. He wasn't Val's batch any longer. They all settled back and relaxed as best they could. Fee could hear it in his helmet. They were breathing in unison now, slow and shallow. Ordo disappeared from the hollow image, no doubt to take the prize data somewhere else to crack it. Skirata simply stayed where he was, occasionally turning to check a screen behind him. After an hour, he spoke again. Update position and intended movement, Omega. Feel us on station in 43 minutes. Majestic, 59. Delta, 35. They're so competitive and macho, Fee said. We're going to have to teach them how to relax. There was a brief snort of amusement from Darman's audio, and then everyone was silent again. The three prisoners shifted from time to time. The human, Far or Jewel, was shuddering uncontrollably in the cold, despite being wrapped like a roasting joint of nerf in all four of the squad's emergency plastifoil blankets. Condensation was forming on the bulkhead next to Fee, and he ran his gloved fingertip across it, making the moisture bead and run. It was just as well the vessel's electrical power was shut down. It would be shorting out by now. And just when things were going so well, all things considered, Skirata jumped up from the desk and rushed out of camshot. When he came back seconds later, it was clear something had gone osikla, or as he always put it, badly wrong. Omega, you've got company. There's a set vessel on an intercept course with you, unidentified but armed and going fast. Have you any power at all you can divert to cannon? Are you certain it's offline? Niner swallowed hard. The problem with a shared helmet comlink was that you heard your brother's every reaction, even the ones you really didn't want to. It was one reason why they checked each other's biosign readouts only when they had to. We blew all the power relays to trigger the emergency bulkhead, Sarge. It's dead. Skirata paused for a heartbeat. Their ETA at that speed is 35 minutes. Attica, I'm sorry. It's okay, Sarge, Niner said. He sounded flat calm now. Just tell Delta not to stop for calf, okay? Fee's adrenaline flooded his mouth with a familiar tingling sensation, and a great cold wash of ice flowed into his leg muscles. You couldn't defend yourself against cannon with a DC-17, not in a sealed and crippled section of a slowly drifting ship. Fee hadn't found himself helpless for a long time. He knew he wasn't going to handle it well. Darman looked up suddenly. He hadn't reacted to all the grim news until then. He turned to face Fee, just a ghostly blue T-shaped light on the other side of the cockpit. I don't want to throw any more cold water on this party, he said. But has anyone thought through the logical sequence of this extraction? Because I bet Delta has.